Welcome, friends. I'm Pastor Jason Neely. I'm the pastor at Delta First Assembly of God. I want to say thank you for coming to this website and checking us out today. And, and I hope that this message that you're about to hear will powerfully impact you in a meaningful way. How many of you are ready for the word? Turn in your Bibles today to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. If you hit 1 Corinthians, you're pretty close. Just take a right. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. If you're there, say amen. It says in God's word today that if anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. What I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word today, and I pray that you continue to make it powerful and potent, Lord, to our heart, to our soul. God, your word changes people's lives. And God, again today, I pray that lives would indeed be changed. Jesus. Be in our hearts today. Impact us. God, use me as a, as a preacher today. God, I pray you continue to touch my lips. God, take my stutter and my stammer. God, that I might be able to speak clearly and concisely to your people this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 This is the third installment of the War Room series. We've enjoyed watching that video clip, a couple of uh, the movie, a couple weeks ago, and, and today is the final installment of War Room. I want to talk to you about the grace of God. That's the title of the sermon this morning, is The Grace of God. And when we deal with the grace of God, we've, we understand the fact that there's an accuser that's out there that's seeking to destroy us, that's seeking to throw us under the bus, that's seeking to destroy the kingdom of God by destroying you and your family. And as we begin this first clip to, to set the stage, as we continue to tell little bits and pieces of this story, Tony is one of the main actors in this, and his character is he is a pharmaceutical salesman. He's been selling pharmaceutical drugs, been making huge sums of money, getting bonuses for extra sales above and beyond. But he was padding his numbers. He was padding his numbers in order to get those bonuses. He was, he was taking one jar out of every sample box and, and socking it away in his garage as a kind of a retirement plan, as a backup plan. Well, the, the corporation found him padding his numbers. But they didn't know about him stealing the pharmaceutical drugs on the side as well. And as his whole world is coming crashing down, he is fired from his job to come and take his beautiful company vehicle away and now he's having what we call a come-to-Jesus moment, right? God is working in his life. The Holy Spirit is working in his life and convicting him. And, and, and through the process, Tony's coming back to Jesus. But as we get nearer to the Lord, we understand sometimes the Holy Spirit will start picking things out of our life and says, we need to deal with this. And now Tony is in his garage and he's been dealing with this. The Holy Spirit's been working in his life, telling him that he needs to surrender these drugs back to the company regardless of the consequences. Which one do you think was the accuser on that video clip? You can kind of tell and sense that, you know, that's Tom. Tom is hostile to Tony, isn't he? Tom wants Tony's head on a platter. Friends, we all have an accuser. Sometimes our accuser is, a, is human. It's a man or another woman. Sometimes our accuser... The Bible says the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of Christians. 
Friends, we know that accusations can be founded in fact or they can be founded in lies. And sometimes it's very difficult to disseminate between the two, separating fact from fiction. When Jesus was tempted there in the wilderness, Satan tempted Jesus with Scripture and with fact. Nothing Satan said was untrue. Everything Satan said in the wilderness was the truth, was Scripture that he was quoting. Sometimes we'll be accused with truth. Sometimes we'll be confronted with fact. When the judgment comes, there's going to be the accuser. Satan will bring, fra- bring facts to the judgment, not hearsay. Satan is not stupid enough to make up stuff before God. When Satan's going to come before God and, and accuse people and accuse you or, or accuse a family member, when Satan stands before God, he's only going to bring up facts because God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows exactly what's going on. Satan cannot pull the wall over God's eyes. Therefore, Satan is going to be the greatest prosecuting attorney ever. Satan's only going to bring up facts. Solid, solid facts. A lot of times people will operate the same way. People will bring both facts and hearsay against you, usually for their own benefit. We've been walking through the book of Daniel on Wednesday nights and having a great time with that and and understanding that There were administrators, governors that wanted to take out Daniel, and they brought up garbage against him, and they set laws against Daniel's prayer life. They changed the laws for an entire country, an entire superpower. The entire known world at that time was the Medes and Persians, was the mighty powerhouse of the day, and they created an entire worldwide law that said no man can pray to their God except for to the king, and the king only for one month. Daniel went home, went upstairs to his upper room, and he opened up, the, had the windows there towards Jerusalem, and he continued to pray as he had always done. And this mob of guys kicked in his doors and went upstairs and seized him. Could you imagine changing a nation's entire law system just to get one man? And they brought Daniel before the king, and they accused him. They accused him of all kinds of things, of being unfaithful and unloyal, accused of undermining the king and undermining the government. Why did they do that? They did that so that they might be elevated to higher positions. They hated Daniel, and they hated the fact that he did his job so well. They felt they needed to destroy him. And friends, a lot of times we act in that role, don't we? We have all caused grief to others. And we have all stood in judgment of others too. Many of us regret that. We regret those things that we've said. We regret the things that we did or did not do. Paul, in this passage here in 2 Corinthians, Paul was also a victim of accusations. We're reading through this chapter here in chapter 2, and part of 1 Corinthians was dealing with something that was going wrong in the church. There were people in the church in Corinth that were, were messing things up. They were messing up the local church. They were making outrageous, outlandish accusations, tearing up the church. And since Paul was the, was the authority, and he started writing letters saying, hey, you need to deal with these people. You need to deal with them. Deal with the immoral brother, he says. And so they found him to be the authority, so they began to attack him. They began to attack Paul, and they went after him. And he was, he was lambasted there in front of the whole congregation many times. Second Corinthians chapter 11 gives us a little bit of, of Paul's response to these outlandish accusations. Someone in the church of Corinth was causing them grief and causing Paul grief. and Someone was saying that Paul was not a true apostle. Don't listen to that guy. He's, he's not really an apostle. His words are ineffective. He lives way out there. Therefore, he can have no power and no sway here. The words there, these super apostles. That's Paul's own words. He says, I'm not like the, the super apostles. Kind of sounds a little bit like America, America's environment too. We've got some of the super apostles that are out there, usually found on television. Paul's saying, I'm not like them. I'm not as good enough to be there. His exact quotes there in 2 Corinthians 11 was, I may not be a trained speaker, but I have knowledge. 
Paul acknowledged the fact that he may not be the best orator, but at least he knew what he was talking about. And so Paul, to us today, is the super apostle. But even in Paul's own time, Paul said, look, I don't have the ability to speak clearly, concisely, correctly. All these other guys over here are super apostles, but guess what? We don't know any of the super apostles' names today. All these other people out there that were, that were leading the Corinthian church astray, and they were following this preacher and that pastor. They were following that evangelist, but we don't know their names. Paul says, I'm not like the super apostles. I'm not like them. Why? Because I'm, Paul's preaching the word. What Paul had to say was sometimes hard, wasn't it? Sometimes it was difficult to hear and difficult to understand. They had to wrap their minds around that. The consequences and wages of sin was death. And that's what Paul preached. But he also preached grace. Someone was saying that Paul was pocketing the money he was trying to raise for the Jerusalem widows, the, the Jerusalem poor. He kept telling them, raise a collection for a year's time. Set aside offerings each Lord's Day. The Lord's Day was a Sunday. He said every time you get together on a Sunday, set aside a portion for the poor in Jerusalem. And people in the Corinthian church, the, the little pot stirrers, you know, they're, they're in every church in America, little pot stirrers. They say, oh, Paul's just going to pocket it, and he's just going to take it himself for his own personal gain. Well, we've never had that in America, huh? Somebody was accusing Paul of having sticky fingers. Someone was saying that Paul could not be trusted. You can't take that man's advice. You can't let him speak to you. He has got no authority in our local church body. He cannot be trusted. The accuser, friend, is there. And that's, that's kind of like Tom that we see on the video there. He can't be trusted. Don't listen to him. Let's throw him in the clink as soon as possible. Let's put him in jail. He's worthless. Let's be rid of this blight upon our company. Tom stood there as the accuser, trying to nail Tony to the wall, but grace. We see the dichotomy there, don't we, there in that video clip where, where one is ready to, to be the accuser and put him in jail and lock the door, throw away the key, and there's Coleman on the other side, the boss. He's wanting to have time to be wise, to be gracious, to give Tony the benefit of the doubt to think through and prayerfully consider some things. And that's grace. That's grace. In a moment, we're going to see that Coleman has had a couple days to think about it. And Tony doesn't know what else to do. They've got no money coming in. All of his big, fancy, inflated paychecks are gone. they got a nice house. And they're worried about losing the house. And now he's worried about going to jail. His fate and his future is in Coleman's hands. They're praying for grace. They're praying for blessing. They don't know what's going to happen, but they're still planning for the future and still planning to go to his daughter's jump roping competition, even though he may be in jail himself. He's nervous. He's frightened. He's a little bit scared. But grace rings the doorbell. You know, not every story for the Christian is going to end like that. No, when we step up and we be honest and we turn over all the prescription drugs we've stolen from our company, not every story is going to end like that because not every company has got a discerning boss like that. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. His boss was a good man, a good, ungodly man. But he still threw him in the lion's den. Friends, we're not going to always have the, the best sunsetting story. But friends, what God has called us to do is to do the right thing, regardless of the consequences. We are to reap, our, our, the wages of sin is death. We have to, to reap our consequences, friends, and give them to God. Let God deal with them. Friends, what is grace? Grace is unmerited divine assistance. Grace is mercy and forgiveness applied. Mercy and forgiveness applied. And I'll tell you what, friends, every single person here today is in need of grace. And it is by the grace of God that we're here today. 
Whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not, it is by God's grace that you're here. It is by God's divine plan, by His providence, that you're here today. It is by the grace of God. They say that oftentimes, but for the grace of God, where would I be? I can tell you what I'd be. I'd be a rotten scoundrel. I'd be rotten to the core, friends. I would be one bad dude. But by the grace of God, only by the grace of God that I'm here. Friends, grace is not, not just forgiveness and mercy applied. It's not, a, not necessarily the consequences are removed. Because the Bible says the wages of our sin is death. That we're going to have consequences in our life. We're going to have to pay the price of those consequences. Grace is not a get out of consequences card. We see that represented there on that clip. Is Tony still had to pay back $19,000 even though he had no job left. He had no job left. He had to, to put his John Hancock. He had to put his name on the dotted line that would say, I am going to vow. I'm going to make a promise. I'm going to commit to paying that $19,000 back. For some of us here in Delta County, $19,000 is a year's wages. That's a lot of cash. And when you don't have a job, it's going to take a long time to pay back $19,000. And so he's going to have to walk around with the consequences of his sin. He's going to have to walk around with that ball and chain weighing him and his family down when he could be using some of that money to go on a vacation somewhere with his family or sending his kids to, to kids camp or to youth camp. He's going to have that debt weighing him down. When he wants to sprint, he can only drag. Because sin is a drag, friends. And even though we may be believers, we may be Christians, we may be weighed down by the consequences of our past, and that's going to be a little bit of a drag. But God's grace is sufficient for you. It'll get you through. God will continue to provide you opportunities and jobs and side jobs trying to pay down that debt. If you honor God, God will honor you. Because it's going to be by the sweat of Tony's brow that he's going to have to dig himself out of that hole. Grace is not laziness. God still expects us to work through it, work through some of our issues like that. When we dig ourselves a hole, God's not always going to bail you out, but he gives you the grace to be able to deal with the situation. Paul acknowledged that same thing. That Paul acknowledges that punishment had to be meted out for that individual in the, current, the Corinthian church. But he also said that individual had to be restored. We have to have discipline in the church. But we also must understand what it is for restoration. You've got to have restoration. You can't have a church all about grace. And you can't have a church all about condemnation either. You've got to have a balance, friends. The Bible says here, Paul is telling the church in Corinth to reaffirm your love for the brother who stumbled. To reaffirm your love for the one who has sinned in the church. The accuser, the one that's going around and creating malice and division in the church. Paul says to reaffirm your love for him. There are those in any church in America. There may be the difficult brother or sister to deal with. <laughs> we all have the difficult brother, the difficult sister in the congregation. God says to reaffirm your love for that brother or sister in Christ. The word reaffirm there in the Greek meant to the confirming of a sale or the ratification of an appointment. What do you get when you confirm a sale there at Walmart? You get something in return, don't you? You get a little scrap of paper that says everything that you bought on there. It's called a receipt. You get a receipt of your sale, and that's what this Greek word is kind of implying is that you have a confirmation of the sale. You have the confirmation that he belongs to the body, that he belongs the body of Christ. Reaffirm your love for the brother. Reaffirm the confirmation of a sale, the ratification of an appointment. Sometimes we call in a doctor's office and they call us the day before and they, they say, hey, we want to confirm your appointment in the morning. Now we get text messages from the dentist. We get a text message the day before. You got to push the button here to confirm your appointment. I mean, that's crazy. When the first thing I saw that, I'm like, who is this? That's the way they're doing it now. Text messages to confirm your appointment. Friends, we've got to do whatever we can to confirm our brother or sister is in Christ, is in the body of Christ. 
to comfort them, to reaffirm them, the, the confirmation of that sale, to give them the receipt that they are indeed a brother and sister in Christ. They have a place here. They have a place among us. Paul goes on to say those that are disciplined may be overwhelmed with sorrow. Well, that'd be something new for a lot of people in the American church. Because a lot of times people that are overwhelmed in the church, a lot of times they're just going to leave. It says that they're overwhelmed with sorrow. Their heart is so broken. They're in such travail. But a lot of times we see in the American church there is no repentance, a very little repentance, because the ego gets in the way. Our own beliefs get in the way. We say, I am not going to submit to that authority of the church body. I'm not going to submit to that pastor. And so I'm going to take my ball and go somewhere else and play. So we never have a submission to the authority. We don't have a submission to discipline. And that's how we created an environment of church hopping in America. The word there, overwhelmed, is the Greek word katapino. Katapino is used of animals who devour their prey or of massive waves that, that swallow up people, being devoured or being swallowed up. Friends, the Bible clearly tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 that Satan is looking for those whom he can devour. Catapino, to overwhelm. Paul is saying, embrace these people that have been disciplined. Embrace the wayward brother, the wayward sister. Bring them back in so that they will not be overwhelmed, devoured by Satan. Paul directs that church to forgive them. They don't want, he doesn't want them to be de devoured by their sorrows. You ever had a grief so deep that you were overwhelmed? Most of the, those griefs that we deal with that are so overwhelming are usually at the loss of a family member, or the loss of a spouse, a son or a daughter. That grief is so deep, it is just an overwhelming, overwhelming sorrow. God says that when we have a repentant brother or sister in Christ, we get to that point. A lot of times it's just so overwhelming. God does not want our brothers and sisters in Christ to be overwhelmed by their sorrow. So friends, again, this obviously speaks to the fact that this individual is genuinely repentant and desires restoration. Where are we at today with the American church? This individual that is overwhelmed with sorrow, is, it is because they have become aware of their grievance. It has become aware to them of their sin. It has become aware to them of their divisiveness in the local church and in the local body. And now they have become overwhelmed with their sorrow, with their brokenheartedness. We don't see that very often today in the American church because in the first century church, there was only one church per community. There was one local body. There was no option to go across town to the other fellowship. And so that one person, he, he, he felt the love and the strength, and he was cherished by the Christian brothers or sisters in Corinth. He didn't have any place to go. He didn't have any other churches to go frequent. Therefore, his, he was overwhelmed with sorrow because he knew that he had hurt his family, the church. But here in America today, we've got so many options. It's like Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors. And our arrogance and our ego gets in the way when we say, I'm not going to submit to correction. I'm not going to submit to that leadership. What they're doing there is wrong because they, they came down on me because they tried to discipline me. They're wrong. I'm going to do things my way. That's the American song, isn't it? I did it my way. Mm -hmm. But that's not God's way. Uh, back in Salida, sometimes we'd have to deal with some issues, and there was a lady that would kind of had a strong matriarchal spirit and a, a strong kind of a, a prophetic spirit, and she wanted to work in personal prophecies in the church, and uh, she wanted to go around me to the people and engage them uh, after service or engage them before service or different things like that, and I began to hear words back sometimes of what she was doing, and the words that she was giving to people was totally off the wall and incorrect. So I had to confront her after a time, after a few weeks of this going on, hoping that she would just calm down and just move along. You know, sometimes they don't calm down and don't move along until you help them along. 
and I had to engage this this woman, and um, she had a very strong, like I said, a strong matriarchal spirit, uh, kind of this. I want to say sometimes it's a Jezebel spirit mixed in there, but they put a they put a spiritual facade on it and call it a spirit of prophecy. Okay, sometimes we have to engage that and deal with those type of people because it's they they want control of the local body, and you got a type A personality and a type A personality. The pastor is set in charge of the local church. And having somebody else working there and trying to work underneath that pastor and work behind his back and trying to confuse the people in the church, that happens. That happens. Especially in Pentecostal and charismatic churches, that happens a lot. And so as pastors, you better have your stuff together when you engage people like that because they will, if you give them the opportunity, they will chew you up and spit you out. I had to deal with this this woman, and I said, "Look, I'm, I, I'm excited about the fact that you want to do personal prophecies in the church, but I want you to run that through me, okay? If God gives you a word for somebody else in this church, I don't know you well enough yet, and I don't know that these words that you're giving don't confirm in my heart. I think what you're doing is you're, you're leading some people astray. You're confusing some people in the church." And she did, was not happy. You know how they get a little bit bowed up? Because you just insulted them. She says, I work for God. I don't work for you. I said, as long as you're in this church, you're under my authority. And I said, if you can't handle that, then you need to leave. You need to understand you're under God's authority and you're under my authority. And if you can't handle both authorities, then you need to vominos. Because sometimes there's people that need to be restored to the fellowship, and sometimes there are wolves in sheep's clothing. And a leader has got to have the discernment to know the difference between a sheep that needs to be restored and a wolf. Okay? You've got to continue to walk through and, and be careful with that. She obviously did not want to be restored. She left in a huff. She tried to start pulling people out of the church to go with her to her own little home church. Hmm. was able to rescue two or three people out of that situation and counsel them gingerly, shepherd them back. We were able to save two and we lost one because of the wolf that was in the flock. But there was no repentance, there was no brokenness, not a smidgen. And a lot of people that deal in local churches today, when they leave the church, more times than not, it's because of offense. No brokenness, no repentance. Paul says those who are repentant in the local body are to be restored back to the family like nothing had happened. Friends, Paul's words here in the 2 Corinthians tell us we have to outwit the enemy. The enemy is not stupid. I love calling him stupid, but I do know he's not. I love calling smart people stupid sometimes. Satan, stupid idiot but he's very intelligent. And it says we've got to outwit him before he outwits us. We've got to be able to outwit the enemy. We must outwit his plans. In this final clip you're about to see, Tom and Tony run into each other after everything has gone down. Tony has been able to avoid prison, but now he sees Tom in a precarious situation. Got a flat tire, what do you do? Friends, we've got to learn how to outwit the enemy. Learn how to outwit the enemy. And what, what Tony did there was a classic example of outwitting the enemy. Not giving the enemy a place of accusation. The Bible says, you know, heaping coals, hot coals upon a person's head by being nice to him. I mean, I can imagine Tom just kind of burned the rest of the day knowing all the accusations that he had poured out on Tony and then he had to think about that the rest of the day. How this man who he wanted to throw in prison came and was a servant to him and changed his tire. That's embarrassing. He much rather would have waited for the tire company to come out and change his tire for him than to have Tony show up. You saw Tom kind of back it up a little bit. Oh, man, this guy's kind of walking towards me. Then he pulls a tire iron out. Now he's really thinking he's got his goose cooked, right? 
But when Christ gets a hold of people, it's a beautiful, powerful thing. God is in the transformation business. How do we destroy the accuser? Well, we can't really. That's God's job. The accuser will indeed be destroyed, but his time has not yet come. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 tells us that the accuser at that point in time has been thrown down. So that tells me there's going to be a throwdown. The question is, is it going to be you or is it going to be him? There's going to be a throwdown, friends. Which one of you is it going to be? We already know that Satan's going to be thrown down at some point, but it's not today. I always go in at night and I love tickling my kids before they go to sleep. And Judah, he's a husky. He's a husky kid. You know, his finger is already as thick as my fingers. I mean, he's got salamis for hands and fingers, I tell you. And uh, he's husky, dude. I go in there. He's in fourth grade. He's a monster. And I'm tickling him. I'm tickling him. I'm pinning his arms back so he can't get me. And he swings. I'm, he swings at me. I'm okay with that. I don't get mad if he connects with my chin. I'm like, Defend yourself, kid, because I'm coming. And also, I'm over in there. I'm tickling him, and he's screaming and hollering. We're having a good time. I'm tickling him all over his body, just wrestling. And I, and, I, and I often close the night. I said, son, someday you're going to be able to whoop up on me. But today is not that day. <laughs> and I go at it again, and I go at it again, and I go at it again. And sometimes he finishes my quote for me, son, someday. And then he, he starts giggling, but dad, it's not today. Is it? No, it's not today. Someday, Satan will no longer be able to pick on you and hassle you and accuse you. Well, that day is not today. So you've got to learn how to deal with the accuser now. Friends, we forgive. We forgive. We need to be a forgiving people. We forgive in order to restore our fellow man. We need to restore our fellow man, the fellow woman of God, the fellow man of God. A lot of us have got some antique cars. We like to restore those old cars, don't we? We put time and money, a lot of time, and a lot of money in some of them. We'll spend a lot of that engaging in those restoration of cars. I've had this old blue truck I've had for 10 years now, and I'm still not done. I still have to, to get the brakes finished up on it and be able to drive it around. I'm hoping to have it for Del Torado Day's Parade this year, and we'll see. But it takes some restoration, and a restoration of an individual can also take some time. And it take, may take a little bit of money to get it along. We're oftentimes more willing to spend time with our cars restoring them than we are restoring our neighbor or the brother and sister in our congregation. Maybe the person that sits right in front of us in the chair. Friends, restoration. We are to forgive and restore. Friends, when, that, when an old classic car is not restored, what does that mean? They're unsafe or they're unstable. My brakes if they don't get fixed, I won't be able to drive that beautiful truck. My truck is beautiful. It's got it's baby blue, and it's got chrome wrapped all around it. It's got beautiful polished uh, bed wood boards in there, white oak, and it's gorgeous. Body looks good, but the fundamentals are not finished. Brakes are fundamental to a car, to a truck. No matter how much time you put on the body, if you don't have the fundamentals taken care of, you're in trouble. Stopping is pretty fundamental. Some of us think that the radio station is pretty fundamental. Don't take my CD player. Don't take my radio. It's fundamental. No, it's not. It's not a fundamental. Engine is fundamental. Tires are fundamental. Brakes are fundamental. Friends, we have to restore the people. We've got to restore them with the fundamentals. You can put all the window dressing and all the chrome on it that you want, but if you don't deal with the fundamentals first, you're heading for a disaster. Friends, we're called by Paul to outwit Satan's plans. We oftentimes hear that God has a wonderful plan for your life. Guess what? Satan has a wonderful plan for your life too. Paul continues to affirm to us that we are aware of Satan's schemes. And friends, awareness should lead to action. If we are indeed aware of Satan's schemes, then we need to defend ourselves in those areas. Paul says that we are not stupid. We're not a stupid church. We know where the attack is going to come from. We know how we're going to get hit. Paul says we're not ignorant of his attacks. The idea that Paul is conveying in this last verse here is that Satan will take advantage of the situation and keep the church weak if there's no reconciliation, if there's no restoration. Satan hopes to have a weak church. Satan's not scared of church. He's scared of powerful Christians. 
There's a lot of weak churches in America today, and he leaves them alone because they're dying on the vine. They're impotent. They're powerless. The idea in that passage there is Satan was to take advantage of the situation. In other references in 2 Corinthians to this Greek phrase continues to denote taking advantage of people in the sense of defrauding people of something that belongs to them. Friend, you may have sinned against the body. You may have sinned against yourself. You may have sinned against a brother or sister in Christ. But you belong to this body. Don't, be, don't allow Satan's schemes to defraud you of this body. We're in this together. We're moving forward together. Don't allow the enemy to come in and defraud you of something that belongs to you. That Greek phrase, that last sentence, talks about defrauding the congregation of one of its members permanently. And Paul obviously is saying that's not acceptable. Peyton Manning is going to retire tomorrow. He just announced it. The Broncos need 11 men to field. We're going to lose a man tomorrow. When somebody else has come up, well, we're playing, you can only play football with 11 men. You can't play it very well with 10. Sometimes we don't like the guy down the offensive line. Maybe there's two, two or three guys down. We just can't really stand him very much. So we try to set him up for failure. But friends, when, when one guy on a football team fails, the whole team loses. Friends, forgiveness may be messy at times. Forgiveness will be messy at times. Tony's hands there on that video, it was greasy, it was grimy, had brake dust all over it, and he shook that pretty boy's hand. I loved it. He had that long white shirt right there. I was thinking, oh, just, just smear a little bit more on that little white shirt. But forgiveness is going to be messy. Tony did not plan on getting dirty that day, but he stopped, he took time, and he changed somebody's tire. He changed an enemy's tire that day. Why? In the hopes, in the hopes that maybe Tom might see a little bit of Jesus in him. Thank you, friends, for watching today's message. I pray that it ministered to you in a powerful way. If you ever want to check us out for our contact information, just look again on the website, call the office, or check on Facebook at Delta First Assembly of God Church. Thanks again. God bless you.